Hello, and welcome to the channel. Today we're going to be discussing the Wheel of Time. I'm really excited for Season 2. Obviously it came out a while ago, but this is something new that I started in January. We made it through Season 1, and now we're going to get into Season 2. And as, as usual, I've got, uh, I've got my right-hand man, Chad, uh, keeping me from uh, frothing at the mouth and getting mad uh, for no reason. Uh, this is an enjoyable show, and I want to discuss why, and I've got a lot to talk about for episode one of season two. Uh, Chad, are you there? I am. I'm back. I'm excited to hop into season two and uh, do the Lord's work out here. I will say I was going back through like the the older episodes that we did uh, even last week and when I was watching this this episode I was like oh man I forgot to go through the intro and so I was like all right when I started it I said I said to myself after the recap I'm going to go into this intro in depth and then this is all I got <laughs> they, changed, they changed the intro they did at the round table of the Dark One's allies. And right. it is creepy as shit. The way that they portray all this. Yeah, so this this whole scene, I was trying to look at it as if I had never seen uh, this season at all. And so uh, what I what what I wanted to look at first, uh, I took the I took the screenshot and I took it with the X-ray on so that we could see that they're saying the show is saying that this is in Telai on Riyadh, and I'm curious <clears throat> what this is all about because Telai on Riyadh to me is something um, is something very specific. So uh, I'm going to be looking at this a little closer as we go into the season. They're they're making this out to be something uh, similar but not quite the same uh, uh mostly because of the the little girl um yeah i don't want to dig into it too much but the little girl being there with trollocs being there doesn't quite line up and so i'm i'm curious if if this is just uh they pulled it out of the book and they're using it their own way which is fine we just got to be aware of that to see where the see where the show is going yeah, so what I'm what I'm uh, what I'm going for going through these is uh, we don't have to try to guess the names or remember the names or anything like that. I was just going for this lady looks like she's from Shan Chan, just from what we've seen in yep. the show. And you know, once I've read the once you've read the book the first time, this is very um, this is very specific. These, these okay. this uh, get up, I guess. Uh, okay. So good. I mean, Sean Chan. That's what that's what I was going for. And then was this? And I don't know if anybody oh, paused yeah. it when they watched it, or if anybody was looking for it. It was on screen for just a flash, and I was mm -hmm. um, shook. Isn't the right word since I knew it was there or going to happen. But to have the to have the visual there right in front of you is oh shit. Yeah. So I think this this visualization is a couple things. Um, one, in the books, the rings are gold only. They don't have a stone in there depicting the color. Typically, yeah. Aes Sedai wear clothing that fits their color, and yeah. that's it. And the the ring is just gold. And so to have the have the ring have a stone in it that's black is purely for the show. Two, uh, at some point, uh, if they follow the uh, Teleon Rio mechanics, they could wave this away and say that uh, how you look in Teleon Rio is up to you. Like a, a lot of it is how you how you hold yourself uh, mentally. So if I'm imagining okay. myself with black gloves and an Aes Sedai ring with a black stone, I could do that as long as I hold the hold the image in my head enough. I could wear wear whatever I want. That uh, plays a, a pretty big part in the story as the characters either discover that uh, the easy way or the hard way, I guess. This was a good um, 
it's on screen for such a short amount of time and it had to have taken some effort to to build this so i just yeah. thought it was i thought i'd capture it I, I thought it looked good and then i wanted to see i wanted to see this like anywhere that girl looked this is these are all the clues that we have as to who ishamael is talking to and so i wanted to you know, I thought this was pretty big. I even went back to the beginning of the scene and made sure I got everybody that I could find. And uh, I don't have the slide from the previous season, but this uh, this is a Borderlands uh, symbol, which I think is interesting. You the know, Nair the Nairns? Uh The Shinar. How do you say? Yeah, the Shinarans. Shinar yeah. for but this is i like this because it's showing that you know it, it's showing that the show is looking for specific things to put in visually to mm -hmm. to do what the book has to do with words you know if the book says you know at the meeting they're wearing a shinar and you know tabard that's a problem because a book reader is going to go oh shit <clears throat> in in the books they even have everybody completely covered in uh, black, they all have to wear masks. It's very, very secretive when they have this in the book on screen so that you can't really tell who's there. And so I like this because it's a visual medium and we're not describing it. Uh, a watcher, a viewer of the show has to really know what to look for. And so I, I like this. I like them giving clues as to who who these people could be without giving it away. Because I think they they cut to a scene where um, where it shows them like hooded, so you can't see their faces. But then right. under under the table, you can see, you know, this to me ha having a tinker as a as a potential dark friend is scary, especially since it looks like the little girl is calling her mom. You know, this is this is a dark friend's child. I think. Yeah. It, you know, kind of. I like it. It's uh, uh, obviously not one for one with the book, which I just explained. But I like this scene a lot. I don't really like why it's there, but I do like it. Um, could you could you imagine if the if the actors that play these dark friends, uh, you know, they they're in the first season. You know, they do you think they knew they were dark friends from the onset? The actors themselves? Yeah, do you think in the script they knew <laughs> they were told? Or if they just played season one to the best of their ability, and then, you know, episode one rolls around, hey, guess what? <laughs> we need you to put on this black hood. Yeah. No. No, and I'm, I'm surprised, too, because... Okay, so what I want to... I have the screenshot of, of them at the table... And so I just wanted to count real quick, because now that you mention it, it would be kind of uh, like a fun as we go through this, see if we can identify each one of these. Um, so we've got uh, one, uh, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and then Ishamayel makes twelve. So we've got eleven, eleven people, and I'm just going to go ahead and count out uh, Pot on Fame, so bring it down to ten. Because huh? uh, we see him uh, here shortly, his his uh, creepy face pokes out. Okay, so we've got ten um, now. I'm gonna assume that this is the Tinker Lady, um, and then I'm gonna assume, make an assumption that the black, if they're wearing black gloves, they're probably an Aes Sedai, I guess. Um, yeah. And then I can't really see anything here. I think that's Pot on Fane. Uh, just because of his hands, he looks that mm -hmm. looks like him. Now, what I was interested in here in this scene is um, white. White is an interesting choice to yes. wear to a meeting, and I'm interested to know if this is the same person that I think it is. Because um, I, I mean, obviously, I'm pulling from the books, which is not really fair, but I think it's an interesting uh, visual. And then um, you can't really see a whole lot of these people, uh, but I'm looking at you know these these gloves, band bracers, whatever he's wearing. 
seems to have like a, a metal piece uh, extending past the knuckles. And then uh, to the right looks like a Nihil. Almost this, like wraps. This, these look like, okay, so like that, those cloth coverings that the, the I.O. wear. I'd be wrong. I'm just I'm okay. making an assumption. On I, this I have no idea. I have no idea. This uh, we've talked about it before. This show is is all, is going to be. They're going to take their own. They're going to take their own approach to all of this. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I like that. So this could be an IEL person. And then uh, you know I don't know if this is uh, black glove or black skin uh, for the hand, but it looks kind of uh, this. I know it's blurry, but it almost looks like the ruffles of a uh, like a fancy. A fancy shirt or coat or something. I can't really, I can't really make it out. And then um, I can't really tell who this is. Now you're you're thinking that one of these might be another Forsaken, possibly. I was I was thinking because in my head I'm trying to picture together. You know I have I haven't got to the book, so I don't know what's what happens here. I don't know the purpose of this. To me, I'm looking at what would be the purpose of this meeting right here, especially at the beginning. And I think that right. this would be a meeting to put in place, set in motion, the events that are going to unfold in this season and probably carry into the next season. Uh, but this is where they all get together to lay out their, their master plan of manipulation uh, in all their far corners of the world to try to push this thing to a front. And it would make sense that somebody who I know is in cahoots with Ishmael right. in this season would be sitting at this table. That, that logic is good. Um, there's, some, there's some things that are different that go on in the book, obviously. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but I, I would say, in general, your, your theory is, is right. Uh, I will say that there is not another force taken in this particular meeting. Um, especially talking with like some someone that a forsaken would consider an underling, right? The forsaken are at the tippy top. Uh, this discussing this kind of thing doesn't really doesn't really fall in line. I don't think any of these people are are forsaken except for Ishamael. I think okay. these are just cronies that uh, Ishamael uh, has called to this meeting. Gotcha. So, so Ishmael doesn't look at other Forsaken as his cronies. Uh, he he does, but yeah. that maybe you know maybe he's playing it cautious and thinks that other Forsaken wouldn't look at him as 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 his, as their boss. I guess. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Like he's he's aware of the reality, so he's not gonna he's not gonna uh, put himself into a position where maybe someone could question him. Who, who brings their child to a meeting? That, dark, that's the real a, question. A dark friend, I guess. Yeah, and then trust their child to not be like, oh, you know, I met a Trollic. Right. Okay, here we have uh, Creepy Pot on Fane. Uh, I will yes. say, for the record, uh, Pot on Fane is mostly invisible. Not, not invisible, but he's uh, actively not interested in being anywhere near the Forsaken in the books so i think we talked about it last season a couple of times where they're bringing him more into the the main plot on the side of evil and i don't know if it's a good decision or not i do know that he is a very useful character for driving the for driving the story if that makes sense yeah he he seems all in on this you know as we watch we're gonna see some of the people at this table they all have their reasons for being there um and it's the really ones good, that really i feel like good phrase i like that I, I feel like the ones that we have seen and we will see in season two they pretty much address their purpose for uh, their allegiance to ishmael and that pat and fame is the one that i'm missing don't see his reason and it's obviously purposeful you know they, they haven't shown they haven't hinted at it um i did find something really grabbing in this episode to me and it's a character that i really enjoyed and i believe his name is ink inktar yeah inktar. Inktar. Mm -hmm. he's a wise person man um 
he plays a really profound character in the small part that he plays in this series. Uh, and, and he's talking to Perrin later on, but he, he brings up the point that Patton Fane probably has a reason for doing what he did. And in talking to Perrin, he's like, Perrin, you know, you, you're probably not going to like his answer, but it's still a question worth asking. Right. Um, and we could dive into that a little bit later on um, when we get to that part in the episode. But just seeing Patton sit at this table it just brings that question to the front of mind of why is he here? What's his purpose? I've yet to figure that out in either the book or the show. Um, so I'm excited to try to piece that together through through the muck. I I think that's interesting too. I I want to see what they do with his character. I want to see um, I want to see them use Pot on Fane better than Robert Jordan did, because mm -hmm. uh, I thought it was done well. It deliberately added to the the confusion of the whole series which some people don't like. Some people want a very clear-cut path, point A to point B. But the, the truth is, is that uh, a real world or even a fantasy world is a messy place. And there is no, it's a recurring theme in the books that there is no real like right or wrong, good or evil. There's a lot of gray everywhere. And, you know, I, I thought Pot on Fane was a good character in the books. Uh, a lot of people disagree with me. So um, I just want to, I want to go into it too. Yeah. So let me go here. Okay. So this is, this is the little girl. So originally uh, I, I kind of stumbled onto Tinker as where these people were probably from by looking at the mom's dress. Um, just for the record, this, this style of, where you embroider like the the flowers and things like that on the on the little vest and on the shirt that is a very uh if i'm not mistaken it's a very two rivers thing to do uh, i think i decided that it was uh, tinkers when i saw the dress but when i was just looking at this outfit that she's wearing i was uh, a little concerned that it was a two rivers uh vest uh but we can we can move on i uh I took this wide shot of the, you know, more, more imagery. We've got more, more symbols. This one looks like it's a little beat up. This one looks pretty clean. We've got like a dude in the background and, uh, you know, one, of, one of these has fallen over, you know, could that be some symbolism? I don't know. Uh, if it is, then there's one, two, three, four more remaining because this one fell over. I don't know what that means, but uh, it doesn't it doesn't mean anything to me from the books, but it could mean something from uh, that they're going to use in the show. Yeah. Uh, okay. So the way so obviously Rosamund Pike is a good actress. I really think this is on display over these next couple uh, like cutscenes and pictures that we that we see of her. She's she's pulling water out of the well she's doing manual labor this is not not something that she has had to do in over 20 years and uh, one of the things that they have a hard time showing on the show but I think is important is that is that Aes Sedai can control whether they sweat or not or feel cold they they can't they can't ignore it and be like immune to it, but a common thing in Aes Sedai, that Aes Sedai can do is they can not show their whether they're uncomfortable or not because of the weather. They know it's there, but it's kind of like a background thought. So just for example, like they could be in a cold environment, everybody else is all bundled up, and an Aes Sedai would just be, it would look like she's not cold at all. She can still get hurt by the cold, like get frostbite, but she doesn't show it. Uh, gotcha. So this this is a very, if you're a book reader, this is a very clear sign that something is wrong, that she's uh, showing signs of being affected by the heat. Um, and then we cut here, she's having to wash her own clothes, which she could do with the power before. You know, she's she's going through some, she's going through some trauma. Yeah. Um, 
I didn't know if you had anything on uh, Moraine, but this is, th th yeah, this is what your note says, that she feels uh, vulnerable. So that's, I think I captured that pretty well. Yeah, I think right after this, she puts her hand down on the water to right. Hail Mary, see if the power's there and, and right. she could touch it. And then right after that, she clutches her legs and gets in a fetal position in the tub. Um, yeah, very, a very, um, you know, I, I am not uh, a woman, obviously, but yeah. that that scene probably resonates with uh, many women. That's a very, a very specific pose that I think women have made to when they're uh, feeling upset or down, or it's just like you're hugging your knees, and sure. it's uh, very, very specific. And I think it would resonate a lot. Um, Definitely not emotion and an, an emotion that you can capture in, in yeah. one word. Yeah. So uh, next we cut to Lan. Lan's apparently going through some shit too. He's, uh, you know, very upset with being cut off from from Moraine, which we get to see a little more. Uh, but right here, you know, he's just going through his his workouts. Uh, and then we we cut to we cut over here to uh, this is Varen. I just I, I took a screenshot of her because I couldn't remember how much we see her on screen. Um, but I think she's got like a book in her hand that's very very Varen. Uh, I have some problems with the the way the character is shown on on the screen, but. I like that they've got her in the brown Aja, which is where she's supposed to be, and that she's supposed to have a little notebook with her. She's writing in it constantly, so. Okay. That's something I didn't pick up on, was her carrying that book everywhere. I'll yeah, she, for I, that. I think she mostly has it, uh, like, on her hip, like, on a, gotcha. on a string or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, look, you can see the... You can see the book right here. Oh, um, yeah. Her little notebook. Good catch. Um, so I thought this was, I thought this was interesting. I don't, you know, we kind of established in, in the beginning of the, of season one that the Aes Sedai are always going to kind of fish for information. And the other Aes Sedai, I felt, would have been a better person if they were going to try to hold true to the way Baron is portrayed in the books. And I, I she's such a lovely character to read, and I kind of wish they had stuck with it because in the book, in the book, she's very absent-minded, and it just would have been nice to see on screen. Like she throws out these little tidbits of wisdom or advice, but she's constantly got her notebook open her fingertips are smudged with ink her nose has has a little bit of ink on it where she you know does the, this motion with her finger and she's very very absent-minded uh constantly distracted and i kind of wish they didn't need her to be uh of a, a, a quote-unquote Aes Sedai in this scene i wish they could have had the other Aes Sedai question land and her be kind of distracted in the background yeah. Um, but that's okay. Uh, I want to move on here because this is you have a you have a note. At least seeing what I saw is that Bale Doman is here, and I don't know if you you had to have seen Bale in the first book. You had to have. I, I was wonder. I was trying to remember correctly. Is he the captain uh, that ran Matt and Tom? Uh, Tom ride with that is correct good catch okay good your, good your I thought brain, that that was him your brain did not deceive you and <laughs> uh, for the for the record this is not perfect but it is pretty damn close uh, I like the casting for this character I like him a uh, lot <clears throat> it seems fitting and and with the accent according to you know the way that Rosamond Pike reads the book it it was right. pretty fitting yeah, I think his, I think his outfit, I think his, um, you know, the way, 
the way they did his facial hair might be a little bit off, but I think they show him wearing a hat right before he walks in. Yep. Uh, kind of the way he's talking to Moraine is pretty pretty accurate. I don't think mm, I don't think they ever speak to each other in the books. Uh, but if he did, I think it would go uh, quite quite a bit like this because she, I think Moraine like takes him for a ride and swindles him out of out of some coin uh, here, yeah. here in just a little bit. He he thinks he's in control of of working with her and yeah finds out. Yeah, he's I mean he's a tra he's a a boat a boat trader so he's he's pretty pretty used to it supposedly. Um, but I think they, I think we come back to Bale and uh, Moraine in just a little bit. I think next is, um, yeah, is is we've got Egwene here in the Amerlin study. I, I believe that's the Amerlin's uh, getup, and I don't really have anything to say about this. I just, I like the, I just like the the visual. It seems. For how big the space is, this fits with uh, the Omerlin. Uh, Suwan is very minimalist, I guess. So you have like a plain desk, and you know her her getup is is over here tucked away. It's not like center stage or anything. And then it's very it's very simple, and I, I like it. It looks fantastic, but they could have decorated this way more if they really wanted to. Uh, next is, uh, so this isn't, I'm not going to like start, uh, drooling with rage or anything, but this is very not Liana. Uh, Liana Sharif is the Amarlin's keeper, uh, keeper of the, you know, she's, she's Swan's right hand lady and Liana does not treat novices this way. This is very much out of character and I was kind of upset about it. Uh, I'm not gonna go into a rage or anything, but not cool. Maybe she's trying to depict that most Aes Sedai treat novices exactly the way you see here is that, you know, they're gonna do all the chores basically. Yeah. Uh, I just meant that for this character to do that is not, not quite, not quite accurate. Uh, my, my next uh, my next screenshot is uh, Alana. It's a cuddle buddy time. Yeah, Alana and her and her toys. I mean, warders <laughs> are having a yeah. you know having a good time. Egwene's just trying to clean up dishes, and I think uh, Alana notices her and even says something like Egwene. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know I. I just thought it was I thought it was funny the the trio over there having a good time just making people uncomfortable just to just to do it. Um, and then one of the things I uh, so this this didn't bother me. I was I was just trying to figure it out why these were wearing white and why she was wearing um, gray. And then later on in the in the episode we see. Egwene wearing all white without the gray. This must be like a to to distinguish whether she's working or not. So that that makes sense. Uh, these these girls are not currently working. Egwene is. That's why Egwene is wearing the the different outfit. Yeah. Um. So here. I just want to point out that in book two, a conversation very similar to this happens where they've, they've been not treated as, as though they were like super important, but they were kind of given the old uh, military recruiter, you know, you're going to be great. Let's bring you in. You'll, you'll do all these great things and have this, you know, you're going to be a powerful I said die one day and then they get to the place and then they're immediately shoved to the bottom with everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that, that was just, that was my only point. I thought it was a, I thought it was a good conversation. 
that they had to kind of show why they're frustrated. I also think they mentioned here that they've been there for five months, uh, which I thought was interesting. I don't, you know, we kind of hear the, the time scale later on, but they've been in the tower for five months. This is a big source of their frustration is they're still, you know, in their minds, we're still being treated like kids five months later when they brought us here because of our power. So. They, they um, need to be taught humility, especially Nynaeve. Yeah. I think, I think Nynaeve is under the illusion that she has humility, but in fact, she, she carries very little uh, in actuality. I think when she, when push comes to shove, people, people show their true colors. And I think that Nynaeve is a great example of somebody who, who is a good person at heart and has a lot of admiral qualities, but in the day-to-day -day grind, she is somebody that comes across as arrogant, um, lacks patience, uh, lacks understanding, um, you know, but whenever it's her moment to shine, she shines all the brighter. Uh, but man, she is like a little problem child when people are trying to help her or get her to see uh, a certain thing. Like right here, you know, they're they're trying to work with them on a lesson and, and teach them some things. And this Asadai right here, her name escapes me. Alana. Um, Alana, she tries to reason with... Uh, Nynaeve and Nynaeve, you know, just kind of bucks back and is a little bit, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Kind of problematic. Um, right. You know, she drinks the water and she's like, you know, you didn't have to say it's clean. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna try. Uh, she's not really given an avenue for Alana, I feel, from what I can see, to really work with her. Now, in the books, it might be portrayed a lot different. Um, you know, and there might be several more attempts that I'm not seeing, but here I see Egwene once again, hook, line, and sinkers, bought into the Asadai, wants to do things their way, looks at this as a way to build character, even though she's frustrated, she right. understands the purpose of this, while Nynaeve thinks that she's in some ways above this. Um, that is That is extremely insightful. I'm... Is this something that you picked up on on the second watch, or, or did you kind of have this feeling uh, right from the get go? Right from the get go, uh, I've been noticing this uh, since season one with her character that this is kind of how she's portrayed, uh, or she plays this part. Um, you know, she's a friend that I would like to have. Obviously, you know, going along this journey, you see them go through all these these crazy moments and and when they're in dire need Nynaeve you know is is at the at the tip of the spear so to speak uh but you know when they're back when they're traveling when you see her talking to Moraine to Lan I feel like she does connect with the warders on a different level she's kind of dropped that uh wall that she's built up but you see in this episode when the warders choose the Asadai kind of over her friendship with them or, or maybe they drop that familiarity that they share to respect the the roles that they all play. She puts that, that wall back up. Right. And so I can see when that wall comes up, some negative characteristics come out in her. And what I just laid out is what I see with her. Uh, but no, this is something that I picked up since the start with with her character. I, I will say... Um throw another little marker here i will say that if i can figure out how to do it that clip is going straight to tiktok um, why so I, I can't tell you it's just it's a, what you said what you said is uh rings true everything that it means the show did a really good job with Egwene and Nynaeve. that's what it means so good that, that actress does a really good job <laughs> uh yeah well Man, i mean problem I, child I think we've said before that a lot of the casting is, is almost perfect. And obviously these are skilled actresses yes. and actresses uh, typically can be good. Actresses and actors can typically be good on their own, but 
if they don't know what direction to go and they haven't read the book, true. then they they're left up to the mercy of the director. And the director is a big fan. You know, he's doing his best is what I've been told. And I think that yeah. you picking up on that is is a good is a good indicator that he's doing a good job. Um, it makes me feel better about things like season three, and it makes me want to defend the show more uh, to people that are uh, based essentially book snobs. Um, yeah. uh, also, my caption. What's your here recovery is, uh, from? Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> I still get upset when I read the book, but um, so I, I also captioned this Queen of Quickies because I'm pretty sure Egwene just uh, went into her room. And yeah, uh, yeah. she, and, like, Egwene gets there, and then Alana is immediately, like, walking into the room. I just thought it was funny. Um, yeah, it, I had a, I had a thought when you were on the the last slide, uh, not the one right before this, but when Egwene was in her room, that that made me think of this, and that Alana, when she saw Egwene in her room and saw her kind of, you know, tensed up and frazzled, she. I think internally she knew I need to go down. I need to go check on Egwene and I need, you know, maybe kind of reminded her that they're here. You know, I need to, you know, while I'm living, uh, not her life of luxury, but a privilege, you know, and as things go on, she maybe not had forgot that Nynaeve and Egwene were there, but seeing Egwene in her room in that moment reminded her she needed to run down there and kind of address them, maybe give them, a little taste of touching the one power working with them so that they don't feel like they're getting lost in these chores that they feel like they're getting forgotten i think that's a good point um from a practical standpoint it could just be that uh she knows Egwene's route and so once Egwene mm -hmm. walked in and walked out alana kind of maybe i mean i like your theory better uh at you know it's also possible that she just knew that Egwene was about to go back down to the basement or whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah. But uh, so I also, we're starting to see some, some interesting things. So in season one, we, we learned from the white cloaks that uh, they don't need to use their hands. Right. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. here we see a full eyes to die teaching these girls to use their hands. And mm -hmm. I do I have a problem with it? Not necessarily. It's actually pretty accurate to how the to how the book goes. You know, the the I said die. She, Alana was probably taught to use her hands, and so that's how she's teaching it. It, it doesn't necessarily show like a flaw in the tower, but it's uh, uh, in my opinion a weakness. And you know, hopefully, hopefully we see some more of that on display later on. Before you move on, what yeah. I found really interesting here, uh, in this, and it, and it might be actually in, in a clip or a screenshot in a couple pics, but she's teaching them with the hands, correct? But when she goes around to Egwene, Egwene's hands are at her side, and Alana mentions that and tells her, you know, your hands, I think she said, like, you, you know, you're not even using your hands or they're not involved. And Egwene was saying, uh, yeah, there you go. It'll be easier if you use them. And Egwene says, you know, I didn't come here for easy. Right. I exactly. felt that that was another contrast or not contrast, but example to show kind of what we talked about, how the hands help, uh, you know, but they, they don't need to rely on that. And I think Egwene better than anybody who sat in a questioner's chair tied with their hands, had this conversation with them knows that there are situations that can come up in her future where she is not going to be able to rely on her hands and she needs to master this now uh really? of using her mind i think that's i think that's kind of goes with the theme that that you have already brought up a couple of times and i'll just try to paraphrase it uh to to make it a little more digestible is that the the circumstances that Egwene is being put through in the show is molding her to be maybe a stronger character than than the normal person that would go through the white tower 
Would you agree with that? Yes. Okay. That's that was kind of the feeling that I was that I was getting. Um, you know, obviously, I know what happens in the books, but that doesn't that doesn't really matter. What we're trying to see is what is the show doing, and it seem it seems to me that the show is uh, molding Egwene and putting her through through scenes and experiences that are kind of making her want to uh, not not buck the system the way that Nynaeve is, but to kind of you know, she, like you just said, she knows the importance of not using her hands because she's already been captured and has struggled with uh, creating a weave without her hands. So I, I think we'll see more of this, um, but I, I enjoyed it. Uh, I thought this was interesting. I don't know if this was just like an eyes to die, like, um, you know, technically they can't lie. And she just said that Nynaeve has 10 times the power of Egwene. Yeah, man. How many times are they going to put this girl down, like, in front of her in this show? I, I've noticed that a lot because Nynaeve and Egwene, they are together a lot. Right. And I feel like the Asadai are all in awe of Nynaeve's power. And Egwene just so happens to be in the room. And they're like, you're great. But Nynaeve, you're special. Right. Well, so one of the things that, because I have a, I have a problem with her saying this. Um, okay. The the only reason is is that. Uh, how do I explain this? So, when an, a a woman channeler just starts to channel, she's not at her full strength. So Egwene, Egwene is not at her full strength. So mm -hmm. what I'm what I'm trying to decide is, is Alana talking about Nynaeve is currently ten times as strong as Egwene? And I think that's what I'm going to have to go with. Okay. Um, is that Egwene is just learning how to channel, but Nynaeve has some raw power that has, um, you know, she's. When does Nynaeve use her power? It's always in desperation. As the wisdom of her town, it was always uh, almost in a panic or frustration to save somebody. So, you know, that, that makes sense that she's stretched her power and constantly pushed. And, you know, she always needed more, always needed more to save somebody that she cared about. Whereas Egwene, Egwene just started channeling last season and she could barely light a fire right yeah correct i think, I think that's the mentality i'm gonna go with i'm gonna i'm gonna say that all of this conversation was intentional by the writers okay that um, sounds accurate to me i can get behind that um so alana here is pointing out the block that Nynaeve has uh they're trying to get her to break it it's it's kind of, I think they're doing a good job of portraying it. It's, it's something that the, the book extends for a really, really long time. So having them condense it down in the show makes a lot of sense. Um, I just wanted to skip to this real quick. So here we meet Shiryam Sadai and I, uh, I went in the editor and changed her hair. I like the highlights yeah so the reason i did that is um so this is the, the clip from the book the woman was eyes to die uh, no one else had that ageless look uh, a glance at her hand showed the golden ring the serpent biting its own tail uh, she was a little plump with a warm smile and one of the oddest appearing women Egwene had ever seen her plumpness could not hide high cheekbones her eyes had a tilt to them that were the clearest, palest green, and her hair was almost the color of fire. Wow. They did not cast that at all. Right. And it's one of those, like, can I let it go? Of course I can. Do I want to let it go? No. Hell no. I like, I wanted to see uh essentially what they described was a uh an asiatic the asiatic eyes 
pale skin, uh, the Asiatic, like the, the folds on the side with green eyes and red hair. And it, and it would have been a strange look on the show, but it would have been accurate. I don't, you know, I don't, is it as easy as finding a, an Asian and putting contacts in with uh, a wig or a color of their hair? I don't know, but I thought it would have been cool to see on screen. That's the way she's described. It would have been cool. Um, but anyways, I did want to point out here that we're starting to see some more Ajas represented. I think in season one, we really only see that uh, when the Amarlin is chewing everybody out over what happened to Loghain. Uh, but this is clearly somebody from the gray Aja. And I think we see a couple people from the yellow at some point. And I didn't get a shot of the lady from the yellow Aja. Um, and then here we've got a screenshot that once again lines up with your notes. I'm, I'm going to give myself a pat on the back for that. Yeah, as you should. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I know the name of this guy. It's uh, Mazarin Taim. So that's what I, I put up here. Uh, but this is, this is good. This lines up with, with things that happen in the book. Uh, a, another false dragon in Saldea, which is in the borderlands. So it's not, it, it's pretty far from where the other characters are at, but it's not like close enough for it to be a problem, I don't think. Mm -hmm. um, so get rid of that. One page down. Uh, okay, so here's where I'm trying to figure out uh, what's going on because we, where I think where we left off, Perrin and and Loyal, you know, I don't, I think they had just gotten robbed, right? Like Pot and Pain took the horn and and dipped. So they're they're chasing him out in the wilds. They've they've hired some, I, I believe, a bounty hunter. Um, a to sniff, help track a Perrin. A sniffer, I think, is what they call it. Okay, yeah. Uh, they they hire him, but Perrin's in a group with the Builder, Uno, um, Ingtar, and, right. and a few others. Um, and they are on the hunt, chasing them, and this is Perrin writing a letter to Nynaeve and Egwene, trying to keep in contact. Okay. Um, okay, yeah, so here we have, here we have this, uh, got Loyal, Uno, I really like Uno's eye patch. I didn't get a good shot of it, but I, I like it. It's got like the red eye drawn on it. And I should have, yeah. I should have found in the book where they describe it. Cause it's pretty, it's pretty accurate. I like it. I like Uno. Uh, Uno, Uno is a book favorite. So he's he's not cussing nearly as much as he should be and i wish they would have leaned into that a little more but that's okay yeah. um i do want to point out that they're doing like some cinem you know some cinematic um fuckery to make this horse look a lot smaller than it really is because loyal is supposed to be huge i mean he's supposed to be like nine feet tall so i think yeah. they're doing a, i think they're doing a pretty good job of trying to show that the horses are the same distance from the camera and show that Loyal is just enormous. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's kind of hard to do without a bunch of CGI, and I think they're trying to avoid that and save it for the, the, the one power. Um, yeah. So here is my first, like, question about what is the show doing? And this is a case where they're combining two characters to forward the plot and save, you know, either save on money or save on developing another character. And to me, it's not so much money. Casting is can be cheap for a character like Huron. To me, it feels like they just don't want to introduce too many characters and they don't want to trust the viewers to... Um, like keep track of that many people. So here's a, a clip directly from the book. 
Uh, Kieran is our sniffer, and this is not Kieran. This is Elias. Um, to me, it's like they had to bring Elias in somewhere. Uh, but just for the record, Elias wouldn't he wouldn't function as a sniffer for anybody. That's not really that's not really his thing. I think you you've read about Elias already. I don't. I, have, I, think, I think I'm right. Not, I was confused uh, when I was watching this. I, I guess I got it wrong because, from my impression, I didn't take away that he was the sniffer. I thought when they took off, they said that their sniffer had set a fire, and when they come up, they're kind of like trying to figure each other out. And I guess I'm I didn't pay close enough attention to this scene. Um, I thought that he had just so happened to be there. That's not the guy that they were looking for. It makes well, sense that he would be the sniffer now that I'm looking back and thinking about it. Um, but I just remember when they showed up, they said that their sniffer set the fire, and, and I think they said that he would whenever he found something or, or create a signal for him. Right. And when they show up, uh, Elias is like, that's not my fire. I didn't put that in. So I was like, oh, okay, right. this, this isn't the sniffer then. That's, well... And that's what we find out is that the wagons were attacked and that's where mm -hmm. the fire came from. But to me, to me, I interpreted that scene as uh, Elias is the sniffer. Um, the, the wagons or whatever caught on fire. Uh, Uno and Uno and company went to go check it out and said, you know, essentially told Elias, like your fire is going to attract unwanted eyes and Elias is like that's not my fire because I'm yeah. not the one that said it so that was my interpretation that makes sense because uh, we don't we don't see the sniffer other than other than Elias at any point I don't mm. think this is the only person it could be um, let's see so if I go to the next one I actually went back through my slides uh, to the first one that we took a picture of. And sure enough, that is... That is the same symbol. Yeah. 100%. However... It does not look exactly the same. I don't know. I don't know how much it's worth uh, going through that, but I did. I did enjoy it. I also noticed that the same, you know, these are all Shinaran, so they're all wearing the same stuff. You son of a bitch! Don't you do that to me? Don't do what? I think I just figured something out. Hmm. So it makes it makes me curious to see how. Because shortly after this, Perrin and him, Ingtar, have a conversation about Pat and Fame. And Ingtar, I mean, he's fighting for the right side. I mean, am I about to throw out, you know, a crazy take? Yes, I am. He's sussy to me now. He's he's a little sus. Why, why you might ask? Because if that emblem isn't the same one, then he's wearing one. And he also seemed sympathetic towards Pat and Fane and brought to the attention of Perrin that he should ask the question of Perrin wondering what was what was Pat and Fane's why. You know what I mean? Okay. Uh, give me give me just a second. I need to get this this sounds like a hot take incoming. Let me pull up my uh let me pull up my chat theory my chat theories yeah okay yeah. so we're this gonna, one hurts me so we're gonna say uh <clears throat> lord ingtar sus yeah he's sussy i just and it hurts my heart because I, I like him i like and his character and you're gonna say uh the the emblem and the sympathy sympathy towards towards a character a, a character like like pot on fame yes. towards a character like uh, I like hot takes 
They're always he's on my short list. Okay, can I can I add to your can I add to your suspicion a little bit? Please. Let's see which which picture this is. Uh, slide forty. I mean, okay. So let me somewhere. Also, how would Pat on Fane know where the horn was? It's a good point. He does. But so, at the end of season one, I mean, this Pat on Fane just waltzes right up to where Lord Ingtar is. Well, that at, you're talking about at the end of season one or, or, or later on? The end of season one when, when Uno and the Builder and Ingtar and Perrin were all chipping up to get the Horn of Valir. Mm. And... Pat and Fane just shows right up to the room that they're in, chipping that up. He's there. Could be in cahoots with each other. There's an emblem. There's an emblem. You were saying that the other one wasn't exactly. So that well, makes that me was just, think it... that was my that was my opinion. I couldn't really tell. I mean, they look yeah, they it, look pretty fucking close, but and they I, do to and me. I, I didn't notice a difference. So what I was looking at was um, right here. It looks like a little, like a little uh, line almost between the wings. And then when I was looking here, I didn't really see that. And I didn't know if that was just a, if that was intentional or if maybe that was a fold or something that I couldn't see. And uh, and I can't, you can't really tell, you can't really tell, right? It's too blurry. No, it's um, I, I don't really see one there. What I want to add to your sus, because uh, this is what I was thinking about when I saw Inktar. I saw him and I looked at this and I was like, well, wait a minute. Look at his hands. Guards, the, the brazer guards on his hand. God damn. Oh, son of a bitch. They son look, of a bitch. They look similar, you know. Yeah, they do. I, I don't, I don't know. It's just... When I was watching it, I was like, okay, I'm going to watch this as if I'm going to watch this as if I've never read anything in my life. I'm just going to go. And so I had these, uh, this picture and this picture, I had it pulled up and off to the side while I watched. And that's why I was, you know, clipping these and putting them together is I wanted to, I wanted to treat it realistically and see, yeah. see what the show is is telling me or not telling me and i'm going to treat it that way and that's what i saw so okay we're on, we're on the same sus train yes uh right. okay so we're going to take a quick we're going to take a quick uh a quick uh, i think this is back in uh it's called um tifon's wall i think in the borderlands with uh baron and tomas and lan and moraine uh, so this is Tomas. This is Varen's warder, and I think he's talking to uh, he's talking to Lan right now. Yeah. Um, and then we'll go here, and this is uh, Bell Doman uh, still negotiating with Moraine, like like he was at the beginning of the episode, and he's he's telling Moraine it's the Hearthstone you want. I want fifty marks for it. And, uh, and then he gets he gets shut down. Um, it gets work. Yeah. So I also want to point out I, I took a screenshot of this too because I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out what kind of clues are where and where the show is trying to take us. And obviously, no viewer is going to catch everything, but the information should be there somewhere. And I want to point out that this. He's talking about, he's saying the old moon dial there, there being Kyrian. He says that in the previous sentence, but I didn't, I couldn't capture all that on one, on one yeah. slide. The old moon dial shattered one night this spring. And this spring being at the end of, at the end of uh, season one was the spring, right? That's that's the impression that I got was that it was sometime around spring, and so it happened right around the time uh, that we had the the last battle, right? That's what I picked up too. 
And I don't know if this qualifies as a sundial, um, but I just wanted to, you know, I don't know if there's any relation, but I know, okay. I know sundials are circular. That's supposed to be tele on Rio. So it may not be like a one-to-one, -one. but I'm trying to, I'm trying to put the pieces together from the show to see what kind of picture it's painting. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Okay, I also, so I wanted to point this out. Uh, there's like a, a small, very short clip of, of like a snapshot of the economy at the moment. Is uh, She says, five marks could buy me the finest Damani racehorse. Uh, so if she's saying that this racehorse has a specific name in front of it, it must be, to me, it must be a very expensive horse. Yeah. So I just wanted to take that snapshot. I'm going to compare it like later on if we talk about money at any point uh, in this season or in season three when it comes out. I want to use this as like a baseline of uh, are they being consistent in their own their own world, I guess. <laughs> just kind yeah, of that's fascinating. Yeah. Um, but. Uh, so. Here, uh, Mr. Uh, Bale Doman gets taken to task for uh, trying to play a clever game with Moraine and gets schooled. And she even is uh, rude enough to bail for, uh, you know, she's even kind of rude to him and basically tells him that you lost, you know, the game of houses is something that the Aes Sedai is famous for. Tyrion plays it, we, we're the inventors of it, basically. Yeah. So I thought that was I thought that was neat, very accurate. Um, and then we don't get to see I don't think we get to see on screen this episode at all. What the hell is she reading? Uh, I have no clue. Oh, I, I I I don't know. It could be. At the beginning of book two, we see a poem from Dark Friends. I guess is the best way to describe it. So it could be that. I'm not going to get into what that poem was, but I mean, uh, th I think Doman says that this poem was like inscribed in blood on the sundial when it broke. So it could be that. It's a pretty fair guess. And I just, I, I like her facial expression. She did a good job here. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So let's see. What is, oh, this is the scene that you were talking about where, where not even the warders are kind of duking it out, right? Yes. Yeah. This was, this was a really good scene and I didn't catch what you were saying because I, I have these characters like ingrained in my head so much that I really rely on you to pick up on what you think, like, what is the, the feeling that you're getting from the character? And you pointing yeah. this out reminded me how true that is, is she's having a good time. She's feeling, you know, strong. She's fighting with these warders. I almost got you this and that. And as soon as they go, I think she says something about Alana. And uh, I don't think he quite says it verbatim, but essentially he's like, that's Alana Sedai to you, basically. And then she, that was then, and then she uh, slams the walls back in place. You know, I'm not, I'm not your friend anymore, which I thought was very accurate. So accurate that I didn't pick up on that, that that's what was happening. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's really good. Uh, I enjoyed it. Uh, let's see. I think right after that, we get uh, Egwene going to, did you have anything else about that scene or was that, was that pretty much it? Yeah, no, I mean, I think you pretty much captured it. You know, you can tell that Nynaeve feels comfortable with the warders more than she does the Asadai, and I think that that's been pretty accurate from the start of the story. Right. You know, all the way back to when she first started hanging out with Moraine and Lan, you know, she spent her nights at the warder's fire, not the Asadai's fire, um, compared to, like, Egwene, who seems pretty hook, line, and sinker with the Asadai and their and their way about things and their I won't call it propaganda but you know kind of the the message they put she'll swallow it you know right. she'll 
she'll toe the line. I need not so much, and I think that this was a really good representation of her feeling comfortable with them. And I think it also went to show that she truly doesn't have anyone she can put her full confidence in in the White Tower. Not even Egwene, so to speak, to the extent that Egwene will toe the line. She has nobody that can kind of understand her. I think that's the point I'm trying to make. Uh, there's no one there that gets it, what she's going through. I, and, and I think that that's what came across. I could swear you've read the books uh, just based <laughs> on that statement. I mean, the show the show nailed Nynaeve's character if that's what you're pulling from it. Does that, I mean, does yeah. that make sense? Like they're, they're demonstrating what you're describing in a, in a way that's so, so uh, natural and so organic that a viewer that's never watched the show before is getting that feeling that Nynaeve is alone. She feels like nobody else can, nobody else can, uh, is going to have her back a hundred percent. You know, Egwene's a sellout. You know that I can't trust the warders. I can't trust anybody. Basically, yeah. That's so good that you're that 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 they're demonstrating that in the show. Uh, awesome. Moving on, uh, Alana is like deliberately misunderstanding what Egwene is trying to talk about, and <laughs> yeah. that's why I put uh, Alana the perv in my uh, in yeah. my title. I thought that was. I thought that was. She's a, a horny old bat, man. I mean. I'm telling you, she uh, she's she's after it. I think she's eating like a pomegranate or something or a passion fruit, yeah, which I thought is. was pretty funny. Mm -hmm. uh, next time they need to show her like eating oysters or something. <laughs> um, and then let's see, what's next? Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, let's talk about this. Um, yeah. What did you? What What are your thoughts on all this? What is your what is your feeling from Leandra? Okay. So let's set some prerequisites. So okay. conversation earlier in this episode was when Nynaeve bucked back at Alana. Mm -hmm. Um you know, Alana got nowhere with her. She went and talked to the lady that's supposed to have red hair, I don't know her name. Cheerion. Um Cheerion. Uh and she basically had to admit the fact that she wasn't getting anywhere with Nynaeve. Um, right. And Leandrin used this as an opportunity. She is such a snake, dog. Leandrin such a snake. Uh, but she used this as her opportunity to try to weasel her way back into working with uh, novices. And not just a novice, the most powerful novice. Right. Uh, and they addressed the fact that Leandrin's last novice that she worked with died, which is unacceptable. Um, but because they are working with their most powerful weapon, that's the way the Asadai, the White Tower, sees Nynaeve as a weapon. Right. Um, they're willing to overlook that to just give it a shot of Leandrin just talking to Nynaeve. That's not what happens as we see right here in this picture. And Leandrin, which is really the only Asadai we don't see toe the line or really hold true to the code of ethics i feel from the show's perspective she's the most rebellious of the bunch of high-ranking acidi i feel and so right here she's just supposed to be having a conversation that's not what's taking place what's taking place is leandrin's putting nynaeve in a place of fear and a place of vulnerability and anger to get Nynaeve to use that to tap the one power. And I think that when you, just from my perspective, when you look at the one power and, and touching it in that way, I wouldn't say maybe it corrupts you, um, but I think the Asadai have their rules in place for a reason of going at the one power in one direction versus going at it in a direction of anger. Uh, and that's what Leandrin's trying to do. I think she's trying to push her in that direction so that she'll she'll kind of bite into that power. She'll bite into that 
different path and that will lead her towards Leandrin and Leandrin can use her for her right. her will, her what's the word I'm looking for? Um her own motives. And that's what I okay. took away from this. So that So I mean just for just for clarification, um just because the you know, I don't know what direction the show is gonna go, but there is there is no distinction of of how to address the source in in the right way. You can either grab you can either use it or you can't. And the way kind of like with the hand motion thing, the way that women typically access the one power is by being calm and uh, they talk about opening yourself up like a flower to receive the source and then you guide it you don't like you don't throw a chain around it and and yank because that's going to fight back it's like the an immovable object i guess or they describe it as a a river if you try to fight the river it's just gonna wash you away but if you relax and uh let it flow around you you can guide it and shape it the way you want uh, however, as we see here, it doesn't appear to work that way for Nynaeve. Uh, she has to be uh, pretty wound up and angry uh, to do it. So I don't, you know, technically Leandrin is doing exactly what she needs to to get Nynaeve to use her power. But, you know, that's not normally how a woman accesses that power. I don't think it really has anything to do with like good versus bad or one camp versus another camp like red Aja versus blue or anything like that. I think it's, it's just, uh, I think it's just different than the way most Aes Sedai access the power. Um, I was under the impression that that was like a ethic, her code of ethic that they followed just based on the dialogue that was in this scene where she said, you know, all the, the sisters in this tower would lead you to believe that there's only one way that you could touch the power and that's not yeah. true. Okay. Yeah, I, I can see that. Yeah, I'm, I'm on board with that. Um, but that makes sense, the way that you're portraying it. And I mean, it, it does make sense that, you know, she's being effective in what she's trying to do. Um, but I think that when you look at this scene and you also take into consideration what Lorraine or Leandrin has done in previous scenes with Nynaeve, she's always trying to get her hooks into her and and scoop right. her up or try to get her into her nest of you know i i don't know what that is because it hasn't happened yet and she plays her cards close to her chest right uh, unless she's combating moraine but that's just what i'm i'm getting as motive here right i i agree with i mean i agree with all that that's a good a good take um i i would like to point out that this scene um, is is different in the books, and part of the reason that uh, Nynaeve and Egwene are so frustrated with being in the tower for so long is that this scene where uh, Nynaeve is essentially like pinned and has to break herself out through using the power happens with the Omerlin seat on a boat. Like the Omerlin comes in, wraps them both up in air, and Nynaeve gets pissed and slams the Omerlin back and uh oh snap and then the omerlin uh shields them both uh or or tells Nynaeve something like uh truce and then they both let go and uh like that that scene plays out differently there and that's yeah. the main that is the main reason why Nynaeve and Egwene are so frustrated with being dumped back down to the bottom as a novice because they were literally training with the omerlin uh, before they got to the tower, if that makes sense. Makes sense. No, it does. That makes sense why at the beginning of the episode they were trying to make contact with the Amberlin. Right. Right. Um, so I took this screenshot. This is specifically um, the like a woman's version of shielding somebody, uh, according to the show. So it's kind of kind of an interesting. You know, somebody's drawing this. Uh, for the CGI or whatever, so I thought this was kind of an interesting. I just wanted to capture it so I could compare it to later, see if we see something similar down the road. Okay. Um, 
I think I have a feeling that given some of the details that we're seeing in the show, uh, that that even the way that the weaves are drawn on screen is going to be important. Um, I could be wrong. I would like to not be wrong. Uh, so I'm going to be looking at uh, anytime they show the weaving uh, as special effects, I'm going to be looking at how that's portrayed to see if I can figure out uh, what it is so that we're not doing like the, uh, so that they're not having to call it out all the time. Like, uh, I guess you could do a simple show like um, like Pokemon, where you tell, you know, tell you have to tell Pikachu to Thunderbolt every time. I just yeah. I just want to see it being done and be like, oh shit, she's trying to shield that chick or whatever. Yeah. So hopefully they're consistent. I hope so. Um, and then here's kind of your. Your point you were trying to make, I guess, or the the end, the ending of that, where where she's trying to convince Nynaeve, like, uh, you just you need to get so strong in whatever way you can, so that no one will be able to take that away from you. Es essentially, as I think is yeah. how it ended up. Um, no, pretty accurate. Yeah, I, I agree. That that's what stood out to me from this was she's really it. It reminded me kind of like in Star Wars, you know, whenever the Emperor's talking to Anakin, trying to lure him, you know, with this power, might use your anger, use your rage, f like trying to feed those things. Like all these other people, they'll tell you don't to steer clear of those emotions, but you have know, such okay. power, you have such might, you, you feed into that and you tap into this source and you'll have so much power that, and Leandrin says this, that nobody could take that away from you, not even me. You know, like I just shielded you. I want to see you so great that I can't even stop you. Right. Yeah. I, I think that's, um, I think this is, is really good. It's a really good scene and we can, uh, we can come back to it at a later yeah. date. Cause I think it's, I think it's going to be important as we get through the season. So this is going to be one that I, I think I misspelled speech wrong. Yeah, I did. I put an EA. Uh, but anyways, okay, so we found the uh, found the traders in the previous scene with uh, Loyal and company, mm -hmm. or uh, the builder as you like to call them. And I didn't catch the screenshot, but I think uh, I think it's important that uh, you see Elias with his golden eyes. Uh, also in this scene, pulls a wolf off uh, a wolf or some kind of dog into one of the ditches and puts a uh, a lantern on them too. Oh yeah, the dog. Yeah, yep. yeah, the, the dog. So, uh, I don't, I don't know if that's uh, that important, but I this is uh, this is this next scene is a scene I wanted to talk about. Uh, if you've ever written, uh, read a young adult book, this is a, basically a scene just straight out of there. Uh, super, I, I really don't like what they did with uh, Perrin's character here mm -hmm. uh, for this scene specifically because this statement, there's a rage inside of me. I know what they're trying to do, but to me it comes off as uh, Jinko wearing all black emo kid declaring him, you don't know how, you don't know how mad I can get kind of yeah that's that's what that's the vibe that it's giving me is that young teenager angst of you have no idea who you're messing with like okay but relax dude like just show me don't tell me yeah no uh, i definitely kind of got similar vibes from this and and that's what kind of bugged me about season one parent i feel like season two does a lot better job of giving him an opportunity to kind of break away from that Okay. Um, and get a little bit more into Perrin's character. Right here, they're not doing that. They're they're feeding into the original emotion of Perrin, his his characteristics. So I'm I'm on board with you right here. It, it was a little cringy yeah. to uh, to watch him talk about this. And then uh, I just get away from that as quick as possible and move on to uh, your. Uh, your hot take. Um, I actually oh, man, that sucks. I took a screenshot of that 
uh, actually, because I had a similar thought. Perhaps Fane had a reason. I thought that was a very... Um, I'm not even going to say it's subtle. I feel like the show does a really, really good job of kind of... Um, kind of guy like like kind of how you're picking up on the things between Egwene and Nynaeve and Perrin if they're that good at guiding you on what a character should be like um, like if the show wanted to the writers are so good at what they're doing they could easily mislead you uh, just like yes. they did in season one with who is the dragon what is the dragon why is the dragon you know, they, if they can do that, now we've got these, um, you know, we're having to watch the show a second time or read the book or look for clues way at the beginning of a season or an episode to show us something that when it comes out is, is a, a shock, even though it shouldn't have been because we've missed something. And I only say that because this sentence after you said what you said and gave your hot take, I'm glad I took a screenshot of it because what the fuck, man? Dude, that's a, uh, you know, and I actually didn't even consider that until I saw the crest was on his pants. I had a suspicion because I heard him talk about like the, uh, the Shin Shinaran, how they were out on the borderlands, and I was like, isn't that where you're from? Um, but I didn't know that he wore that symbol. Uh, I just missed it whenever I was looking at him in full dress. Uh, but when you had that screenshot, I was like, son of a bitch. No well, way. I mean, to be fair, I took the screenshot because I, I just, that was the one that is the easiest to see. So Uno yeah, has... Yeah. Uno has one on his breastplate that's like uh, embossed on the, his breastplate. So it's not like it's not like only certain people wear it. They all have the symbol. I just took yeah. that one because it looked it looked uh, the easiest to see. No, for sure. But that whenever I saw that symbol on him, it made me think back to this line right here. Oh, okay. Of him saying that, so I was like, okay, he's sympathetic because. You know, also things that we've seen in season two, some of these dark friends, they, you know, they may not want to choose this life, so to speak, but they need to. They have, they have a purpose and reason for doing what they're doing, okay. you know? Um, and I'm thinking of the Black Aja that we see later in the season. Won't get into details, but that just makes me think he's, he sounds sincere in this, but it makes me think as he coming from a place of of experience uh, we'll have to find out we will have to find out yeah um, so I mean we can we can come back to that uh, as the show progresses I just uh, I wanted to I wanted to you know show that show that on screen given what we talked about earlier in the in the episode um, moving on I wanted to go to so what I was trying to do this time, part of why I have so many of these uh, screenshots is that I noticed that uh, if I don't take one every scene, it increases the likelihood that you'll have a note about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Um, so I think uh, this is where, uh, yeah, it's just where Lan and Moraine are, are fighting, basically. Yes. Uh, and uh, Lan, I think, uh, leaves in a huff, and then uh, it's real, it's like not real quick on screen, but it feels like really short. Like they, they just kind of mm -hmm. butt heads and then Lan leaves, right? Yeah. So, uh, is this the scene where he uh, tells her, go get your own food, basically? Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So I thought that was, I thought that was interesting. Um, and then. I'm probably gonna skip over this real fast unless you have something specific. But uh, this no. is this is purely set up for the next scene, and it, and it it's it's like irritating, I guess. It's very emotional, and I'm not interested in that at all. I love the emotion. I want I want to feel emotionally drained at the end of an episode. 
uh, so you can go uh, turn your shower on and you can't tell if you're crying or not. Pretty much. And then just try to work through the emotions in the show that I can't work through in my own life. Oh, <laughs> oh <That's> man. What <laughs> I... <laughs> Jesus Christ. Jokes, That's, man. Uh, just jokes. Fucking heavy, man. Uh, well, moving on. <laughs> uh... So we just heard uh, the the full letter. What does the letter yes. say? And then we come over here, and uh, well, I have a I have a couple of things because I think one of the things I talked about in season one from the very beginning is that we hear that the Aes Sedai cannot lie, which lines up with the book. We hear about the three oaths which lines up with the book. And then my running theory is, is are the show writers going to make these Aes Sedai lie or are they going to be clever and construct these scenes so that um, you could defend what they say if you suspect them of lying? Does that make sense? Like they want to make the scene complex enough and make the Aes Sedai say something a specific way so that mm -hmm. they could, you know, you can defend them off screen. Because obviously this is just Matt and just Leandrin. And it appears that she's lying because she's telling him that Matt Cawthon is not mentioned. But in the previous scene, we hear that Matt is mentioned. And I just want to point out that I just told you two true statements as well. Matt Cawthon is not mentioned. Matt is mentioned. Exactly. Exactly. And, and so, like, that's the kind of, uh, that's what I'm looking at when, when we're watching this is I'm trying mm -hmm. to catch, trying to catch, like, an outright lie. And you do that in the books a lot, too. Once you find out that the, the Black Aja exists, you start going back to, to book one and realize that, you know, they're, they're fucking everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> damn yeah well i didn't i didn't quite realize that but i mean yeah now now that we're talking about black aja i thought once you broke once you became a black aja you were allowed to manipulate the the truth thing or some of the like uh code of ethics that they were held by like an acid i can't lie well if you're a black aja and you've already broke one of those fundamental laws that made you an Aja, then I guess you can. Well, I mean, we don't know. The show hasn't, the show hasn't established that. Was the book established? I mean, that's kind of a, I mean, I guess it doesn't matter sure. since they could go different ways, but in the, in the books, uh, like way down the line, like book seven, yeah. book eight, book nine, they, they come up with the theory that well, if the black Aja exists, then presumably they can get around us just asking them, are you Black Aja? Right? Because if they can't lie, they could catch everybody by just going up to everybody and saying, are you Black Aja? Yeah. So they, they then come up with the theory of, uh, well, then they must be able to lie. So um, that's, that's, what the, that's what the books establish really, really kind of late. And I say establish other, like, when I say they, I'm talking about the core, the core components of the, of the white tower. I'm not talking about, uh, there's specific characters throughout the, throughout the books that have their own, like, like there's a character in the books that knows that the black Aja exists, um, but she's not going to get into an argument about it with the White Tower because it's not worth her time. She's got other shit to do. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, but anyways, uh, so I, I'm going to defend this and uh, say that Leandrin, uh, what she said is technically true. I would agree with you. Um, now, why she did that... Uh, I think is is pretty obvious, and mm -hmm. a bitch and a bitch move. She's uh, she's clearly trying to keep Matt uh, down, feeling down, and uh, and 
isolated. And she's a manipulative bitch. So I yeah. said I can twist their words for to accomplish whatever they want. And she's being a, a cold-hearted bitch right now. No, we don't. We don't fucks with her. Yeah, that's for show. Sure. Yeah. So uh, next scene. Uh, I think we're getting pretty close to the end. This is. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, we've got. Uh, Parent. Yeah, seven. I've got seven, seven shots left. So mm -hmm. this is. Uh, we find out that this is Beltine, right? Like they're Egwene's like making a lantern, and that's when Nynaeve walks in, and then Leandrin is like, oh, you know, they're talking about you know, being at Beltine together, no mention of Matt Cawthon to kind of drive drive the dagger home. <laughs> and then um, then we see here that uh, apparently all the main characters are able to find the material to construct lanterns. So I just, they're all in different places and they all have managed to construct a lantern. So it must not be that hard. Um, <clears throat> but anyways, Perrin puts his ring on the lantern and then changes his mind and picks it back up. So I think that's, to me, that's him um, not wanting to let go of uh, Layla. Yeah. Which uh, I think that's where his rage is coming from, his yeah. inability to let go. Right. Right. And then uh, I, I actually thought this was the end of the episode. And so it took <laughs> me by surprise when it wasn't. But uh, this is... Uh, obviously, this is Rand, and he has constructed a lantern just like all the other people. Uh, they've cut they've cut their hair. He's cut his hair, and on the X-ray, it shows him being in Kyrian. I don't know if that means anything to you, but we did hear about Bail Doman talking about Kyrian right right before this, a couple of scenes ago. So uh, I think. I think that's uh, good consistency from the show that they're kind of pointing oh. us in this in this direction. Yeah, no, I didn't pick up on that. Um, <clears throat> well, I didn't. For one, you know, it's it's not clearly said that he was in Kyrie, and I mean, it is on the X-ray, but I I wasn't looking at the X-ray. Right. Uh, right. So I didn't know that that's where he was. Um, but that's interesting. I'm a, I'm gonna think on that. Um, I'm gonna have to go back to see what what Bell said. Give me just a second. Uh-oh. Where's my... Uh... Oh, man. I was testing, testing my chat. Let's see if my chat works pretty quick um, that's pretty cool I lost all my custom emojis from uh, pirate software's channel I guess I my sub mm -hmm. my sub some my subscription expired or something because I can't I don't have my little uh, bongos and the little yeah. ninja little ninja dude like I normally have so that's all right um so let me just pick back up where we left off and i think we're gonna yeah we're getting pretty close to the end so i think the scenes are starting to get chopped up a little bit more because right here i think um land like brings the plate down and he's kind of sulky and they're like, uh, do you expect us to wait to eat? And he's like, yes. <laughs> and uh, and then uh, we wait for a little bit. And then Varen talks about how, uh, how strong and stubborn Moraine is. And I think she kind of goes into, um, I guess, like what, what uh, being cut off from the source can do to you, I guess. And then, uh, and then Lan grabs Moraine's plate, and Walt goes back upstairs, and Moraine's not there. She's not. She's not in her room. He dipped out the back. 
She yeah. gone. Yeah, right here. Moran leaves. Um, also, I can't tell you how many times I have to like pause and unpause the show to get a good screenshot because typically <laughs> if I just pause it and try to take a screenshot, their face is all like mid sentence and their mouths open and, yeah. and all this other. It's not great. Um, you do an impressive job with these screenshots. Thanks. Um, so I did want to point out, like, I do not remember this scene at all in the show. I don't remember this scene at the end of episode one. I don't remember anything about this. Like, I feel like here's what I think happened. I think that I watched the show, this episode up to this point and made the exact same mistake that I made this time and thought that the episode was over and went outside to smoke. Oh, and, and so I missed all of this. I missed this. Yeah. And I missed this. This was sick. I, uh, yeah, was. she outsmarts this guy, this fade. Like she moves her boot on the ground. She moves her boot on the ground to like bait him into like, I guess, shadow jumping whatever this mechanic is uh it's not really shown on the books uh very much um but like this guy like is on the other side of the rock and moraine like baited him and then just stabbed him in the face which i thought was really cool she's a savage yeah i mean she immediately gets cut but oh yeah she gets fucked up for sure uh, but you know, here here we have the uh, the blood. She got sliced, and uh, Land's not happy about it. Um, and then I think uh, I I didn't get any good screenshots. It was really hard to do with with the way like the, the straining the, softly. The uh, I didn't get any good screenshots of the fight, but um, like Land goes into this pretty big battle with the fades and. I don't know if you caught it, but they're like showing these fades to be moving like really, really quick. Like yeah, when... I put in my notes the fades play with them. Yeah, the fades are playing with Lamb. Yeah, uh, they're they're having a good time. They they love uh, they love suffering, and they love uh, teasing their their uh, the people they're right. trying to kill, basically. Uh, I did want to point out that um, I don't know if you got this imagery from watching the fight, but I kind of did because I knew what to look for. But what you're supposed to get the feeling of is like a snake striking, like a viper, like a, mm. a snake coiling up and then like going in for the attack really, really quickly because they're very, very fast. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, so like if they... If they lean their head, it's supposed to be kind of sinuous movement. And then when they strike, it's supposed to be really, really quick. And I also want mm -hmm. to point out that I think Land kills one right off the rip. So I think he gets two of them. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken. I mean, just just so you know, I mean, we kind of, we kind of talked about season one. What does a heron mark mean? He doesn't have the blade, but uh, he killed two fades. That's uh, that's some pretty serious some pretty serious power right there yeah no for sure uh, and i hope we i hope we get to see more swordsmanship uh in season three uh so right here i thought they were like trying to hint at something you know she's like straining and then she this is this is the part where i'm trying to decide um if they're creating a plot hole here because it says straining softly and then i think she looks in this direction and sees some power right i think she looks over there and sees something going on am i am i mistaken on that no she it looked like she saw the room um and they did that because the show writers want you to be like oh did she touch the source okay but just the... to find out no she didn't Okay, but she either touched the source and created the magical effect, which we don't think mm -hmm. happened. We think that Varen came to the rescue. Or she didn't touch the source, but still saw a leave, which means 
she yes. has access to the source. It's like a contradictory, contradictory thing, potential plot hole, unless the writers are explaining it as she did touch the source enough to be able to see another weave, but, okay. but not enough to actually help in the situation. So I don't, I don't know. To me, it feels like a plot hole. Uh, yeah, from from my understanding, she's she's knotted up. She, yeah, she can't use the the one power. And I'm talking from somebody that doesn't know how the book mechanics work. So this probably is wrong. But from my understanding of what the show's trying to get across to me, and what I know is later to come in this in the season, she's twisted up in this knot with the ones with the one power and so it's not like it's been ripped out of her right it's there it's just twisted to where she can't do anything with it um so she still has the one power she's just not able to do anything with the knot if that makes sense okay that's that's my understanding of the way that they portrayed it and visually and yeah like you said women aren't supposed to be able to see weaves it's like a man characteristic of somebody with the source if i'm remembering correctly we, we can't we can't see each other's weaves so like if okay if a man is channeling a man can see another man's channeling or at least sense it and a woman can see the weaves of another woman but can't see what a man is channeling according to the books okay and I think that they're not playing by those rules for a couple reasons because right. the weaves offer a lot of options when you're talking about visuals like right here it's set up this this moment where the viewers like oh shit did she get it back it's not hers it's Baron's right but you they get to play with that they obviously set you up right here because you don't know Baron's there she's in a moment of great need that's when the one power comes into play is in the in the moment of, of desperation and she's obviously straining softly <laughs> so, right you know she's going for it but right. it's not there so i think i think you're right to be frustrated because they are not playing by the mechanics of what you understand is this story they're kind of making it their own um but i like that I like that. I, I don't want to see, you know, where I'm watching as a viewer and sometimes from the perspective of Moraine, I'm seeing some weaves, sometimes from the perspective of Rain, I'm not seeing others, you know, kind of similar to when Moraine was pulling the, what is it, Shadar Lugith mist stuff out of Matt in season one and everybody in the room's witnessing her weaves rip that out of them. And Matt's like, you know, I saw that stuff come across your face and to me, if if I'm missing details visually like that, I'm just left wanting more. Okay, I mean it makes sense. I, I mean we'll we'll have to see for sure like what what the yeah what the real situation is. Uh, I think I think that's my last one. Is yeah, there's your notes. So, um, so we see the straining softly, and then. Um, and then Varen comes to the rescue, right? Uh, yes. I believe this is what happened. So. And then uh, Lan's last words are, what are you not telling me? Right before she passes out. Marie. That's true. And I think it has something to do with the poem that she read. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't remember. Uh, I don't remember from the show. I'm assuming I'm assuming it has something to do with the poem. I th I think it's what I just took was he's like you know this whole thing this whole whole ordeal, you know you're getting chased by fades, you know you're running away from me in the middle of the night after you've cut off our bond. What what are you what's going on that you're not telling? Right. I feel like that's that's where he's coming from. So a little bit more broad. Hmm. Um. But I think that Moraine's intentions are directed at the poem. I, I don't know. I get. I. 
I guess we're going to find out because I, I really don't remember. Yeah, we shall see. Yeah. Well, that's, that's it. Made it to the end.